um, uh, Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter two, and uh, I want to pick it up there in verse one. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. We live in a remarkable age as a church. Now I'm pretty loud, so get me. I'll let them modulate me to where I don't hurt anybody's ears. We live at, in a unique time as a 21st century. Uh, late time period for the church if we're to understand anything about biblical theological history and uh, it appears that every theologian on the face of the earth that's worth his salt or been saved at least saved believes that we live in the last days uh, and and a lot of these guys they're not all bible believers but they have the the biblical wherewithal to know that we're in the last days as a church now, the world doesn't think we're in the last days. They're thinking it's going to get better, everything's good. Uh, <clears throat> check with your, uh, your local candidates and your <laughs> political platforms of the day. They'll all tell you it's good, man. We got peace. We pulled out of Afghanistan. We've done everything right. And, man, peace is coming. Everything's good. It's all, uh, all's well. There is no hell. And that's kind of the motto of folks today out in the world. Oh, it is. Man, it's better now than it ever was. I'm doing good. Yeah, why are the farmers crying that, you know, beef is 14% up in the grocery stores and they're getting 1960 prices, 20% less on the hoof uh, than, than they, they did earlier in, in the, like the, the 70s and 80s. And now they're way down and say, what is that? What's a monopoly on the meat packers? There are only about five or six meat packing companies. And so they control the market. And if you want to sell your steers, you pay to truck them there. Just read all that. Just, a, just amazing to me. You know, I grew up with farmer's roots. And so I can listen, remember my mother and my father listened to the stock market it's on WLW every morning to see what beef was selling for and uh, that would let them know we raised bucket calves up to veal and then uh, you know 1,000, 1,500 pound steers and we tried to sell them and make a, make a living at it uh, you know at least a, a side hustle at it we would say today but and you can't it's hard you say why oh it's getting better didn't you hear the news it's getting better everything's good then why is Facebook in the trouble they're in? Why is Instagram in the trouble they're in? Huh? Uh, so it's getting better. No, it's not getting better. Why are there 71 murders in the city of Cincinnati to date today? Last night somebody else was shot. And I listened to the interview. Did anybody catch that interview? This is all introduction to what I want to say tonight. They interviewed some man down on the street across the, the Rhine down there in Cincinnati. Oh, by the way, if you want to shop, go down there to Finley Market across the Rhine. I preached down there for five years every Thursday and Friday. Brother, it's still just as criminal intent as it ever was when I was there. That's where the guy was shot. So they asked the guy, hey, what do you think we ought to do? Uh, what do you think the problem is? He says, well, I'll, I'll tell you what the problem is. There's only two things. He says, love and money. That's the only two reasons anybody would shoot anybody. And I'm thinking now, is this guy serious? Is, is he okay? He didn't have a clue. And they said, well, how do you think we ought to fix this problem? I think you ought to go down to the clubs about 3 in the morning when they're all letting out because that's where all the people are. And you need to pass out flyers and tell people, hey, you need to get a grip, quit shooting each other. I said, boys, <laughs> I'm not real bright. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But I got enough sense to tell you that ain't right. That kind of thinking will get you in bigger trouble. Amen. And when I hear stuff like that, I, I like cringe. I feel like I ought to be back down there on the street corner preaching. But even when I was down there 30 years ago, uh, week after week after week, people didn't like it then. What do you think they feel now? Last time I was at Fountain Square, some of you went down with me. Uh, we weren't received very well. You say, why? The world don't think it's about God. That's why. They think it's about your habitat. They think it's how your environment. Look, Adam and Eve was in a paradise and they sinned. It's not about where you grew up. It's, it, you could be in paradise and man has the propensity to keep right on sinning. And folks, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. That's my introduction. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul do about this. He warns these folks. He says, now we beseech you, brethren, 
Of course, talking to the church by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He believed he was coming, an, an imminent return of Christ because of what Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2 says. And by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. And that day has a reference to the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ or the second return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? Right before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know when he rides in on the white horse with all his saints with him, right before that is the catching away of the saints of God. We call it the rapture of the church. That is the first part of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul zeroed in here. And he says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, anytime you see a phrase like that, that day, that day, the day of the Lord, pay attention. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. I want to stop with those three verses because I won't have time to go any further. I want to talk about the condition that we find ourselves in as a church tonight. I've been doing a lot of preaching on this the last little while. I went to a church Sunday and I preached along these lines. You say, why? Because I believe every ch church in America, maybe with the rare exception of a few, are facing more apostasy than they've ever faced before in their life. They're facing more of the falling away than we've ever faced before in our life. We have more people going away today than coming in today. And truly, we as a church have seen the same thing. So I think it's pertinent to talk and preach along these lines for the church to say, why? Because the apostle Paul said this, now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or trouble, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that that day of Christ is at hand. It's to comfort those that are here. Be glad you're here tonight. Be glad you're one of the folks that showed up for church on a Sunday night. You say, why? At least we know you're not of the other group that have quit going to church. Amen. That's my text, one, two, and three. Now, here's what they teach you in seminary. Read the text. Explain the text. Preach the text. And they need to add one more thing to that. Then shut up. <laughs> so tonight, I've read you the text. I've roughly explained the text and I'll bring you three little things tonight that I hope will help you as we look into the depths of what the Apostle Paul was talking about, shall we pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for a chance to pray. Thank you for the fact that you hear prayer and you honor prayer and you answer prayer. And that you bid us come to the, bowl, the throne of grace boldly. So I pray for help and utterance to preach your word tonight that you'd suit a blessing to each one of us come, that you'd strengthen the inner man of every child of God that's here, that you'd fortify them, refurbish them, retool them, and help them to be all that they can be for thee in this late and last hour. Bless uh, Pastor Tom as he's away tonight and pray for his safe travels and his, uh, his long journey that he, he must take to get back home. And I pray, God, here for each one of us that you would help us. If there's one loss, that you'd save them before it's eternally too late. It's in Jesus' name I pray and ask these things. Amen. I do want to thank you for singing songs tonight. I enjoy our singing. I really do. I, I enjoy a lot of singing. Not all singing, but I enjoy a lot of singing. So I enjoyed the songs tonight. And uh, Saved by the Crucified One, that's one of my favorite songs. And I appreciate that because that's how I'm saved by the crucified one. Amen. And uh, the fact that Brother Jeff, I always get him to sing, God can still save old sinners. Say, why do you like that song so good? I don't know. It, I got saved when I was 12. I wasn't an old sinner. But I've worked on a street corner down there where there was a lot of old sinners. And I've seen a lot of guys get up out of the gutter and I've hauled them in my van and took them to the drop-in center or to the city rescue and got them cleaned up and, and got them a shower and got them some food to eat and got them a bed to sleep in and went back later and checked on them and sometimes after they were sober led them to the Lord and seen God's ability to save from the guttermost to the uttermost. So let me say this tonight. He's still in the saving business and he can
can still save old sinners. I mentioned a word that I've been talking about a lot lately, and that's apostasy. And it's a fancy word that uh, has been used for years uh, in, in and around churches and folks. Apostasy simply means to fall away. And uh, in our text, verse 3, is, he said, except there be, they come a falling away. And a falling away is just not showing up, not coming. Uh, and, and that is known to the child of God, the Christian, uh, the, the, uh, as apostasy, not wanting to have anything to do with the things of God, the spiritual things of God, the word of God, or anything about God. That's a falling away. Because we are in the last days, and he mentions that, it is the time of the falling away or the time of apostasy. I believe we live in that age. Now we can pull the blinders down or around. We can continue to have tunnel vision. We can continue to wear the rose-colored glasses, if you please, and act like everything's okay. I'm here to tell you everything is not okay. It's not okay in America. It's not okay in the world. It's not okay in the homes across America today. And it's not okay in most of the churches around the world. And probably we can include ours in that too. Oh, surely not us, Brother Phil. No, I see a lack of a desire on behalf of people to hunger after the things and the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Uh, we used to long to see somebody surrender to preach. We used to long to see somebody surrender to go to the mission field. So my children done that in my lifetime, and they went. And that was a glorious time in our church. I've been at this church 12, maybe 13 years, and I haven't seen one missionary come out of our church. Uh, most of the preachers that are here were preachers before they came. Maybe Brother Samuel. I think I dealt with Brother Samuel when he said, How do you know if God's called you to preach? And I said, Well, Bro, brother... Here's what I go by. If you get up Monday morning, you're real lazy and you don't want to go to work. That's one sign. And the other one is if you're just craving fried chicken. You've probably been... <laughs> you know I'm just pulling your leg now. <laughs> I told you it was an apostasy, amen. Brother Jeff said, preach on sin, brother. <laughs> preach, preach around it here a little bit. Let me say this, there's the reality of apostasy. I mean, opening our eyes, taking the blinders off, laying the sunglasses down, and actually focusing on what the real issue is. And my friend today, today, I would like you to understand, I believe that we're experiencing apostasy. The little book of Jude, that little epistle over there, when you look at that thing in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, and that's, that's just the simple basics. A man saved by grace through faith, plus or minus nothing. So he says, I gave all diligence to, to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Could I say this tonight? People are not earnestly contending for the faith. Now they'll say, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I got saved. What in the world happened to you, man? Where'd the zeal go? Why don't you want to tell anybody about Christ? Why don't you want to bring anybody to church? Why don't you want to go out and tell anybody? I, I don't understand. Used to be a time we, we did all. I, you say, well, COVID come along and really changed everything. Yeah, COVID really. No, COVID shook the bush. COVID shook the tree. And by the way, the dead wood fell out. And... The tree gets pruned back. It, verse 4 in Jude, For there are certain men crept in unawares. Yeah, you'll have that crowd. Oh, I think you ought to preach on love, Brother Phil. You guys just, your spirit's all wrong. Oh, oh is it? I don't know. I feel about like the Lord did when he went in the temple and they were exchanging money. Uh, get a little irritated, a little hot under the collar once in a while. He says, he says here, 
There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, they've always been around. They'll always be here. They were around old days. They're still here today and they'll creep in yet today. He says, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I can remember dealing with folks here out of this congregation who were of not of the same belief that we hold to from the Word of God. I'm talking fundamental things. I'm talking simple things. I'm talking about the base things, the thing even called salvation. Oh, I, I just think there's a lot of ways a person might get saved. I said, that's not what the Bible says. Well, I really go more along the lines of how I feel. And you get that. We've gotten that right here in this place. You say, what is that? That's apostasy. That's a falling away. That's somebody that's crept in unawares trying to sow the seeds of discord among the brethren and say, there's more than one way to heaven. I got news for you. There's one way to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And they want to call you homophobic. They want to call you misogynistic. They want to call, yeah, one way, you just believe in one way for salvation. I heard Dr. David Gibbs on the platform. He's the guy that founded the Christian Law Association, whom we've used here in this church. And uh, it was sad what he had to say. When he spoke, he talked about the problems churches get into because of, of belief. And he said he's been handling a lot more cases these days on ch a child abuse cases. And the pastor there said, would you explain that you're finding child abuse in the churches? He says, well, let me explain what I'm saying. I just heard this the other day. He said, we're being, they get their lawyers and they come in to a Christian school and they want to sue the Christian school and the church because they're teaching that Jesus is the only way that a person can get to heaven in our fundamental independent Baptist churches. And he said, you mean they, they say, yeah, you've got to teach many ways to heaven so that everybody's comfortable in your church. Now that's your, your educated worldly lawyers that think and act like our government. He says, what in the world do you do? He says, we take a stand. We stand up and we say, we believe if you teach a child anything but Jesus is the only way to heaven, that that in itself is child abuse. <laughs> Does that work? He said, it has so far because we have just as much right to our legal opinion as they have to their legal dogma. And we'll see where the laws go and what's going on. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying our country's churches are in a mess tonight. Amen. And people, we have the blinders on. We don't see it. And Jude, when he cried out, he says, ungodly men turning the grace of our Lord, our God, into lasciviousness. And, and, and you know, that lasciviousness is, is anything you can think of under the sun that's inappropriate, lewd. And they want to try to make you think that transgenders in the church is okay. I got news for you. You are who you were born by as. I don't care what you're thinking now. Say, well, I... I just think God made a mistake when I was born. I really don't feel like I'm a boy. I think I'm a girl. Look, you're going to die and go to a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You say, what is that? That's Romans chapter 1. That's a reprobate mind. Somebody does not want to retain God in their knowledge. They've rejected God and they would rather worship the creation than the creator. That's Romans chapter 1. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They'll always deny the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way. They'll always deny. You say, what? That creeps into our churches today. 
So the reality of apostasy, it's here, it's beginning, which I believe was at the birth of Christ. People say, well, it just happened. No, no. Apostasy started at, at least 2,000 years ago. So how do you know that? Well, take your Bible and go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Hebrews 1, 1. God who at sundry times... And in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2, hath in these last days. Now, Paul, the writer of the book of Hebrews, is saying and saying currently at this very moment, and that's a book with Hebrew connotations, Jewish connotations. So he's speaking to possibly the saved folks that actually got saved in Israel at that time or there around about that area, those Jewish people, because the first people to get saved were Jewish people. And he says, hath in these last days, he says, these are the last days. So at the birth of Christ, when Christ was born into this world, brother, that was the beginning of the last days. We got about 4,000 years from Genesis to the cross. And if we're to understand this thing right, there's only 7,000 years and then the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, plus or minus a few years. You say, well, how do you get that? Just from studying the dispensational breakdown of the Word of God. If God works by seven, so there's basically 7,000 years, and a 1,000 of those years is the millennial reign of Christ, which happens in the end. So come back a 1,000 years, you're into the church age, which is possibly 2,000 years long. Say, how in the world do you get that with those numbers? Your math is a little fuzzy. You sound like Al Gore. Well, put it up in neutral a minute and let the Word of God do some thinking for you. Jesus, when he walked on this earth, he went down to Samaria. And before he went to Samaria, he told those disciples, those apostles that were around him, he said, needs be that we go to Samaria. And they went, oh, Samaria? Well, them ain't Jews. At best, they're half-breed Jews. They don't believe like we believe. We consider them Gentiles. Well, they're infidels. They're not going to get saved. Why are you going to? And man, they were all upset. They weren't voicing their opinion like I'm showing you here tonight, but they were upset that Jesus was going to go out of his way from Jerusalem down from Jericho and go into Samaria where it was a bunch of off-breed Jews. And you know what happened? John chapter 3, John chapter 4. John chapter 3, he's in Jerusalem. John chapter 4, he's in Samaria. And the woman at the well comes out. And she said, sir... Thou being a Jew, what do you have to do with me? She knew who she was. Would to God the world knew who they were. She said, what are you saying? I don't have time to develop all that thought, but let me say this. He said, needs be we go through Samaria. He spent two days in Samaria, two days. He said, well, what does that mean? Well, Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 8, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Peter said that? Yeah, Peter was an authority on these kind of things. And Peter was the apostle to the Jew. And he lived to see the Jew reject Christ. But at this point, Peter says this in the last of his days, and if one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day, so two days would be about 2,000 years, and he went to a bunch of Gentiles for two days, that's about 2,000 years. Guess what? The church is a Gentile church. He came to the church. He's going to stay about roughly two days, and we're out of here. You say, what is that? That's a 2,000-year reign for the church. And then it's called out. You say, are you setting dates? No, I'm just showing you how late the hour is. 2021, 21st century. We're just about out of here. When calamity comes, when trouble comes, when things don't work out the way they should and you're tempted to be grieved, as we taught on in Sunday school class, you're tempted to be put down, put aside, put away, put under. You ought to step back, throw both hands up, both hands up, and say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. You say, really? Yeah, really, I'm serious. But beloved, well, Paul says this in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, I heard Jeremiah preach on this a while back. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. When the Spirit starts speaking expressly, you really better pay attention expressly. Because it's like getting a 
a coffee. You just didn't go in and get a coffee. You got an espresso coffee. <laughs> Some of you got a double shot. <laughs> Say, why? <laughs> it was expedient for the moment. So the word here is used by the Holy Ghost. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what's going on. We want to think there's no devils. We want to think nobody's preaching any false gospel, any false doctrine. Look, we've had them come in here and had them leave here. And they still hold into the same old belief they always had. I'd like to tell you that everything was good and everything was peachy. Everything was Chevrolets and apple pie, but it's not. Tonight, we're warned in Hebrews, we're warned in 1 Timothy, we're warned in Jude, we're warned in 2 Thessalonians. It's building. I made reference to the fact that when did it start? I believe it started at the birth of Christ. Say, how do, how do you get that? Well, when Christ was born in this world, we'll be talking about it in a little while. Christmas is right around the corner. You know, Bonnie said something to me. I'm never supposed to mention my wife's name, but I will tonight. Break the rule. I said, is there anything you want, honey? And, you know, I try to do things for her, help her out. I, I wasn't always that way. I was born in Gabbard, so we feel like everybody ought to do everything for us. We shouldn't do anything for anybody else. I said, anything you want me to do for you? You know, it's, you know, it's falls coming on. We love the fall time. She said, yeah, there is. There really is. And that's very unusual because generally she don't have anything for me to do. I said, I didn't know what it would be. I thought, well, maybe she wants me to get the firewood on the porch. I don't know. Maybe she wants a fodder shock and a pumpkin. We got, oh, they're gone, pumpkin, you know, on the front porch. I don't know. You know what she said? I want my Christmas lights put up. I almost fell out. Christmas lights. I said, what'd you do? I went to Walmart and bought Christmas lights. What'd you do? Put them up. So now we have beautiful Christmas lights across the front of our log cabin. And I told her now tonight will be the first night you've been out for a while and you get to come back and your Christmas lights are going to be on. She said, well, they weren't on yet. I said, they're on the timer, honey. I got to pay this light bill somehow. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? Well, the fact of apostasy is building. The Christmas lights don't have anything to do with it. But I wanted to say this, it's building at the birth of Christ, and we're going to be talking about it, and Christmas has something to do with it, because remember when Christ was born, we call that Christ Mass, and it's actually a Catholic holiday, and it's the worshiping of the sun god, if you really want to know. Now, it's not even Halloween yet, so I can preach on this, and nobody should get mad, amen. You watch it, somebody will want to have the Santa Claus come in, and uh, you know, you say, what are you saying? You remember when Christ was born? He didn't come to the rich and famous. He didn't come to uh, the, the blue bloods. He came to the common man. He came to the, the shepherds and the, the fishermen. And he appeared first to the, there in the stable. And you know what Herod did? The political powers of the day, they tried to stomp out the Lord Jesus Christ. They tried to kill all the boy babies and wanted to do away with them. You say, why? Just like in the days of Pharaoh when they were looking for that one man called Moses who's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to kill him. And his mother had the presence of mind to take him and put him in a basket. She had woven with both hands and put it down on the Nile River. A picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at his birth, he was attacked by the forces of evil. He was set upon by Herod himself. And they killed a many a boy baby looking for this one that claimed to be a king. And you know the story. So apostasy began at the very birth of Christ. Because before Christ, there was no church. We're talking about the church and the problems in the church. So apostasy, it's building, or the fact that it has been growing and is about full grown at this time. Apostle Paul said this in his day, and he loved the nation of Israel. He loved the Jewish people, but he was sent to Gentiles, and Peter was sent to the Jews. And the Jews were constantly rejecting Christ, especially as a nation, few folks getting saved here and there. Paul said this in Romans eleven twenty five, 25. And, and the world still doesn't believe this today. 
Romans 11.25. For I would not, brethren, again, we're doing the same thing. He just said that, that ye should, ye should be that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Least ye should be wise in your own conceit that blindness, watch this, in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Even the writer here of the book of Romans understood that the Jews were in blindness. You say, why? Because of rejection. When did that happen? When Christ came, presented himself to the nation of Israel, and they rejected him. That's when apostasy started. And brother, the devil's been fighting anything that has anything to do with Christ since he was born. There's a difference in how the church responded in those early days and how our church and our churches today respond to the things of God. Study the Jew, study Israel. Blindness began upon their rejection of Christ. Also notice the church age from the time of the Antioch church the Antioch church in the book of Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. If you study manuscript evidence, say, what's that? That's the text where the Bible comes from. There's two lines of text. There's the, there's the line of received text that we know today. And I'll just leave it simple like that. It comes from Antioch. There's another line of text that comes from Alexandria, Egypt. They had their hands on the first writings of the Word of God. and They uh, began to write their Bibles. Could I say this? Your King James Bible is the only Bible out of well over 200 translations that come from the Antioch text where they were first called Christians. All the other Bibles, all the other scriptures, the NIV, the RSV, and I'd have to step over to this chart where they've got a Bible drawn and read through that whole list. That's why that chart's there. All that text came from Alexander, Egypt. It was corrupt text, and it always took from the deity of Christ. Yeah, apostasy started as early as 60 A.D., by 96 A.D., they had already exiled John on the Isle of Patmos, and he was writing the book of Revelation. And they were against John and what he preached because he wrote, he wrote St. John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He had some hard things to say about the church in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he wrote the book of Revelations to the seven churches. His ministry was to the churches that we might have it today and that we might understand. So here tonight... They were first called Christians. When, when the church first was established, uh, when persecuted at that time, and it was, the early church was persecuted. you understand that? Read Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, the first Christians that got saved. Well, they even, they even beat uh, Peter and those men, Peter, James, and John, put them in prison. They beat them. And Peter was in prison, and the angel came and, you know, kicked him in the side. Get up, man. You ain't done yet. And he got up, and the doors opened. He walked out, and Rhoda, Rhoda was at the door. And there was 120 of them in the upper room. Christ had just died, just resurrected, and warned them that these things were going to happen. Say, what was that? That was apostasy. That was somebody against the church. That was the, the demonic forces of hell trying to put down the church and put out the light of the church. You realize the church is the only institution that God has instituted that has the true light, the true gift, the true word of God tonight. And the church come under persecution. Therefore, Peter preached in that first church. There was 5,000 added to the church. Another place, 3,000 added. Brother, we don't see that today. There's one difference in the church. Watch this. When persecuted, the church went out and preached the word of God. Acts chapter 8 verse 4 says this. Talking about the early church. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad, and that's what happened. They come in and persecuted them. Say, what, what, why? It's called apostasy. There was a falling away. The falling away began uh, as charged by the devil and put on the workers of the church and the workers that worked in and around the church. And he says, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word of God. In other words, when persecution came on that early church, they just shut the door there, went on down the road. When they locked that door and preached over there and preached over there and went over there and preached. 
I heard, uh, we, we've got it easy, guys. We've got it easy. And we don't sometimes realize the apostasy we're in, the coldness we're in, the lukewarmness we're in. I heard Dr. Paul Chapel say, he's a pastor of the church there in Lancaster, California, the Baptist church there, and chairman and president of the West Coast Baptist College. And I heard him say, and it was in conversation with Dr. David Gibbs again, and he said, yeah, we were just in China last year. And the best of my recollection, I'll tell you the story briefly to show you. Look, we get to thinking that, oh, this is church. This is how it is everywhere. This is not how it is everywhere. I'm telling the, you the church in many places in the countries and the world today is under persecution. And brother, it's a sure shine. It's more persecution than the church has ever been before in its life. And brother, he said, we were in China. We wanted to go to one of these underground churches and we went and the pastor got up and said, okay, I'm going to have, I think maybe Mr. Gibbs, brother Gibbs preached that night. And a lady put her hand up and said, I'd like to sing a song. Now, this is in Mandarin. This is in Chinese. But, yeah, they, if, when they get saved, they sing about Jesus. Amen. And she got up and she said, I want to sing two songs tonight, not one, two. And they said, sure, okay, yeah, sure, come on, sister. And she sang two songs. And I think maybe after it was over, Mr. Gibbs wanted to know why she wanted to sing two songs. And the pastor said, well, you know, their family goes to an underground church and they were here to hear you and so on and so forth. And uh, last two weeks ago, the, uh, the communist police and party came looking for people that attend these underground churches because it's illegal to go to church. It's illegal to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in China. I know we're in America and we have the blinders on. We have the rose colored glasses on and we don't think that this exists. But I'm telling you, it's here. Said uh, they arrested her father and they took him away for execution. And they killed him. And so she wanted to sing a song for her father his demise and she wanted to sing that other song because the next week they came and they were looking for her mother and when they found her mother they said do you go to this underground church do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and she obviously said yes and they took her away and she's never seen her again and feels like they probably executed her too and she thirdly wanted to sing those two songs in church because she feels like probably this week or next week they'll come and get her now that they've tracked all of them down. And she's probably never going to ever get to sing in church again. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about things that are just now happening, just right now in the 21st century that we don't know about, that our liberal news media doesn't tell you about. There were 17 people, 17 missionaries captured down in Haiti. Did you see that? You say, well, what are they going to do with them? They want ransom money. I got kids living on the border. They moved out of the interior of Mexico because it's dangerous down there. You say, why? Uh, anybody that's a Christian is under persecution. They want to steal your kids and then exploit the rich. Revelations chapter 3 verse 17 churches that are comfortable sitting on padded pews with plenty of money in the bank and they want your money and we'll give it. You say, why? Because we're in apostasy. And they went everywhere. You know the difference between the early church going everywhere preaching when they got under persecution and the church today? Well, today, when persecuted, church gets a little trial, a little tribulation, a little persecution. Folks just go away. COVID moved in, rolled in. Boy, that thinned out our ranks. Look around. And by the way, all those people aren't sick. All those people aren't afraid of catching COVID. All those people are just out of church. Take your Bible and go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. I told you, you're not going to like what John has to say. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. 
If you think everybody that says they're saved is saved, got to take the blinders off, get those rose-colored glasses off. <laughs> Amen. Look, sin, worldliness, it's so present in our everyday church. There are more complaining Christians than preaching Christians, more complacent Christians than settled Christians, more compromising Christians than standing Christians. <clears throat> the reckoning of apostasy, the realization of it, it's here. I've given you a few illustrations. It's here quickly, the reckoning of it. You know what you say, what are you saying? What to do about it? Jude, that little book of Jude, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all this to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. Listen, this is a message of exhortation tonight. To exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. And say, How in the world do I contend for the faith? It's, it's too hard. Let me remind you, the way of the transgressor is hard. He says, my yoke is easy. Come and learn of me. Look, if you're yoked up with the world, it's hard. You can't get to church. You're too busy. We heard it this morning in the message. But if you're yoked up with Jesus, your priorities all of a sudden change because he's the lead in the yoke. And if you're yoked up with him, it'll be a blessing to serve God. You'll change your schedule to serve him. A common salvation, a contender for the faith I see here in Jude, a comfort for the true believer. Verse 20 and 21, we read it earlier. Even in, the, even in the face of apostasy, we can serve a living God. You say, it's impossible, Brother Phil. We just can't serve God like you guys did 50 years ago. Yes, you can. Turn the TV off once in a while. Read your Bible as a family once in a while. Pray together, cry together, laugh together. You say, well, I do that now. Good, amen, hallelujah. Most families don't. Mom goes one way, dad goes another way, and the kids, who knows where they go. The rejection of apostasy. I definitely want you to see the reality of it. We're here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying. The reckoning of apostasy, what do I do about it? Just stand fast, be faithful, hang in there, do the best you can. I'm getting a little long in the tooth. I'm getting a little old. There's days I really don't feel good. But I still want to come. The rejection of apostasy. How do I reject apostasy? How do I just say, enough, I don't want it anymore. I don't want to see it anymore. I won't do it anymore. I don't want any part of this thing anymore. Now you're getting warm. The rejection of apostasy, James 4, 6 and 7. James 4, 6 and 7. The book of James, but he giveth more grace. Amen, amen. Grace is something only God gives. Brother, he said, can two walk together, at least they be agreed. Brother, you start walking with God, he'll agree, you'll agree with him, he'll agree with you, and you'll be the recipient of his grace. Uh, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Brother, the proud never get in. Too heady, too high-minded, too haughty, too, too proud. Seven, submit yourselves therefore to God. Say, how do I reject apostasy? Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Brother, that verse over there in the book of Matthew, about chapter 18, still says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of God. We're there. And I'm going to claim it. Now tonight I'm about finished. But I wanted to say we need to learn how to reject apostasy. You say, well, preacher, I can't go to the mission field now. I can't. I can't. I, I'm shot. I, I can't sing specials. I don't have a good voice. I can't play an instrument. Look. <clears throat> God knows that. There's a story in your Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And it's a story about David's men when they went to Ziklag. And somebody come in, the enemy come in, took all their people. And there were some folks that he went and prayed and said, God, what should I do about this? He was running from Saul. He'd been anointed king, but he wasn't king yet. He said, Lord... The people are speaking of stoning me because I've let this happen. And the enemy have come in. They've taken all of our cattle, all of our 
of our spoil, our wives, our children. They've taken everything. We're, we're, we're beside ourselves. What should we do? He said, gird yourself up, put your sword out, and go get them. That's what he said. And that story said, when he said unto his men, God, gird, ye on your, gird ye on every man his sword. You want to know how to reject apostasy? Put your sword on. That's the word of God. And they gird on every man his sword. And David also gird on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. You say, well, brother, I, I can't put the sword on again. I can't go preach. I can't go to the mission field. I'll tell you what you can do. All those people that were with David, they were wore out. They were weary. Some of them couldn't go any further. So they put down all the unnecessary things that they were traveling with. And they said 200 of them stayed by the stuff. And the rest of them went out to battle. Go back and get, get their loved ones. Take a stand. Then uh, Samuel, the book says over in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 24, For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, and, and those people that went down to battle, they got everybody back. They got the spoil back. They got some more spoil back. And they come dragging all this back in. All the wives were okay. All the children were okay. Nobody had lost their life. They brought all that back. Man, they were, they were hooping and hollering. They were having a hoedown. They were coming back. And they had their eye on the bounty, on, the, on what they had gotten, the spoils. And man, we're going to divide this stuff up. And David said, we're going to divide it up evenly among all the men. And there was a confrontation. I want you to know how God feels about it. If you can't go preach, if you can't go to the mission field, if, you get, if you'll just stay by the stuff. You can reject apostasy. He says, for who will hearken to you in this matter? But as the part as that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. You say, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying just stay in the fight. Just do what you can. You say, really? You're not calling me to the mission field? No. I'm just calling you to reject apostasy and stand for what's right. So I think, I think I could do that. I know you could. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul said this, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I think all of us can reach that point if the rapture doesn't happen, if we want to, if we choose to. Say, what are you saying? I'm saying rejecting, reject this falling away. Get saved first. Get settled. Get to serving. Get in someplace. I think every child of God ought to be a member of some good Bible preaching, teaching church. And if they're not, you're just a part of the falling away. Uh, pray without ceasing. Prove all things. Practice by witnessing and testifying boldly to others about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that, I had pray. And obviously, the folks that can't get out, that can't do, can pray. Wasn't it good to see Brother John in church this morning? What a blessing. I went up, shook his head. He said, it's so good to see you. He told me that. I said, good to see me? Most people are glad when I'm not here. I didn't tell him that, no. But it was so good to see John. You say, why? Does something for my soul. You say, why? He was here, man. He was here. Now, you know what? John ain't going to get back to church Sunday night. You got that? He probably can't see and probably shouldn't be driving right now. huh? But you know what? He's staying by the stuff. And his heart is here. He says, he told me this morning, I love coming to church. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I wish there were more people like that. Amen. See, and he'll split. The rest of us out here preaching and teaching, running up and down these roads trying to do something for God. Look, John's holding a rope, <laughs> staying by the stuff. <laughs> Say, do you think you could do that tonight? I'm not calling you to Bishop Field. I'm not calling you to preach. I'm not calling you to teach. I'm not calling you to sing a special song, anything like that. Do you think you could stay by the stuff? You know, when they came back with all that spoil, all those kids, those people by the stuff, I guarantee you, they jumped as high, shouted just as loud as the other one. You say, well, they didn't have any part in the fight. Oh, well, yes, they did. They stayed by the stuff. And I guarantee you, they were praying. Amen. Oh, Lord, deliver them. Oh, Lord, help them. Bless our leader. Bless our preachers. Bless our fighting men. Bless our lions. You say, well, I'm not a lion anymore. You can be a lamb. 
Stay in the fold. Stay in the fold. All right, we'll maybe have a verse of song. Give you a chance to respond if you need to. Obviously, as a stand for word of prayer, I've probably been a little wordy tonight. I apologize for that. As they get ready, let me just bow your head just for a minute. They're going to sing. Just bow your head, and I'm going to say my prayer and let somebody else close us out later. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your folks. I love these people, and I ask God that you'd help them, you'd bless them, you'd strengthen them in the inner man, and Lord, they'd, they'd love you for it. And they, they would hold to your unchanging hand. And, Lord, they'd be guided by your unchanging word. And, Lord, they would trust and believe in your unchanging promise. And God, I ask you to fortify them and to lift them up and to help them and to bless them tonight. But, Lord, if there's somebody lost that just got in, I pray for them and ask you, God, to help them. Somebody struggling with their Christian walk, oh, Lord, may, may they draw nigh unto you. May they... May they draw nigh to the fellowship and know that there's strength to be had just from this group that believes that stay by the stuff. Blessed tonight. If somebody's struggling with that, may they not get out. May they stay in. If there's a lost person, may they be saved. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it. Amen. What shall we sing, fellas? Just as I am. Two, All right. Just as I am. Everybody knows it. Sing a verse or two of that song. If anybody needs to pray, please come and uh, make yourself at home here and bow at this old altar as we sing.